Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend, co-host, sound guy, and tolerant of all my jabs, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. I'm tolerant of everything, Mike. I'm a tolerant, peaceful being. <laughs> that is a load of baloney. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Let's get to it. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. As our content contains mature themes, harsh language, and graphic descriptions of violent crimes, listener discretion is strongly advised. What you're about to hear most likely took place in Canada. If not, it will include Canadians. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists. If, if you're looking for impeccable research and well-written content, CBC News or the Globe and Mail might be a better bet. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Welcome to episode 16 of Dark Poutine. This is a good one. I'm very familiar with this story. Were you... Once again, I am not familiar with this story. It's I... like, I think we get together every week so I can tell you a story. But you know what I, I love about it, though, is my reactions are genuine in the moment to the stories. Because I literally yep. don't know most of them, or or I at least... Uh, not aware of all the details, so so I love just kind of coming in, sitting down, hearing a story. Yeah, so this is this is another one that takes place around uh, my hometown, which is kind of interesting. So it's about Jane Hirschman. She was also uh, called Jane Stafford at one point. She was physically, mentally, and emotionally battered uh, by her live-in husband. Mm. Uh, they weren't married, but she had taken his name. Anyway, she took the law into her own hands on the evening of March 11th, 1982, just outside of Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Interesting. She silenced her tormentor, Billy Stafford, with a single blast from a shotgun, but her struggles were nowhere near over. So who was Jane Hirschman? Who was she? Uh, Jane was the second of four children. She was born on January 25th, 1949, to Gladys and Morris Hirschman. Uh... Morris was called Scrubs by his family. He was in the Canadian Armed Forces and fought in the Korean War. Upon coming home from the war, Morris drank heavily all night and went to work the next day. He did his best to take care of his wife and kids, but they were never that well off. Morris also got violent when drinking, sometimes hitting his wife and kids. He was also arrested once by meatheads. That's the derogatory name for the military police or mm. MPs. Mm. Uh, he had stricken a, a military officer during a fight. Morris Hirschman was transferred to West Germany by the Canadian military, so the whole family had to move to Europe. Hmm. Jane hung out with other military brats, as that's what they do. She learned to speak German and traveled around Western Europe. Sounds pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, at 15, Jane met her very first serious boyfriend, a Canadian serviceman a few years older than her. Jane felt as though this young man treated her better than any man had before, but that was short-lived. So, by any man, she meant her father as well. I was hoping so, because at 15, I'd hoped there wasn't a plethora of... Of men? Men. Well, I did say it was her first serious boyfriend. Yeah, no. no. So, Morris was transferred back to Canada, and Jane left her first love behind. The family moved to Winnipeg, and Jane hated it there. Hmm. You don't say. Is that a dig against Winnipeg? No, uh, I think, yes, it was. Okay, yeah. good. 
She wanted to move back to Nova Scotia to live with her grandmother in Liverpool to escape her overbearing alcoholic father. According to Brian Valley's book, Life with Billy, Jane Hirschman said upon arriving at her grandmother's house in Liverpool, I'm in a safe place now. Mm -hmm. Right away, Jane got tangled up with an older man named Milford Milfy Wynott. Was that his, his last name was Why Not? Why Not? Well, I could think of a lot of reasons why not. There's a lot of people with the last name Why Not in it's... Lunenburg and Queens County. It is a very, very popular name. I kind of want that name. It's a, I could go into it, but Vino, which is another, it's a French name. I guess it's an Anglic Anglicization of Vino. Okay. Oh. So, All right. why not? I'm, there's no reason why not. Exactly. Anyway, Jane found out she was pregnant just after her 16th birthday. Jane and Milfie were quickly married. The marriage was in trouble right from the beginning. Milfie liked his drink. Mm -hmm. He'd go out for hours with no concern for Jane's feelings. Sounds like she married her dad. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's sad, but yep. it's what ends up happening a lot. Yep. He asked her to come along once in a while, but she was generally miserable. Jane went, went into labor, uh, and Milfy was nowhere to be found. A friend of the family had to drive Jane to the hospital, where just after 5 a.m. on October 9, 1965, Jane's son Alan was born. Milfy was passed out drunk and missed the whole thing. Life went on a few years like that, uh, with naive Jane starting to grow up and get wise to Milfy drinking his face off and sometimes being unfaithful. Jane didn't leave, though. She became pregnant again, and her son Jamie was born on October 17, 1972. Yeah, a year and a day before my birthday. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Not really. No, it's it, not at all. <laughs> Just an absolute coincidence? Here are numerical facts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jane hung on for another three years. In January of 1976, she'd had enough. She gave Milfy the ultimatum that many wives of alcoholics have given over the ages. You need to choose either me and the kids or the bottle. You can't have both. Guess what? He made the smart choice, uh, went with the wife and kid, and the story ended happily ever after podcast over. No. Oh. Milfy chose the bottle right there and then. In yeah. fact, uh, in the book I read, he picked it up and kissed it. Oh, Jeez, really? He did. Yep. <sighs> Morris and Gladys Hirschman were now back in Nova Scotia, so Jane packed up the kids and some of their belongings and headed off to her parents' place in a snowstorm. Next week, Jane went back to tell Milfy she was divorcing him. Milfy didn't want a divorce. He wanted to keep the kids, and Jane got the runaround of the local wel welfare office as a result. Because if you don't have the kids, you don't get the monies. Mm. Mm. Especially if you are a, uh, uh, a work-ready adult. Yeah. So Jane's lawyer told her that she didn't really have any grounds for a divorce. Uh, Jane didn't tell him about Milfy's unfaithfulness because she thought that would be unwise somehow. Or, uh, odd, or, okay. Yeah. Huh? Uh, but anyway, so she was in a jam and she couldn't see a way out. She had an idea. A few weeks before, at a New Year's party, she'd met a man, Billy Stafford. Jane and Billy spent a little time chatting after Milfy had passed out, which was typical of him. Classic Milfy. Classic Milfy. Jane confided she wanted to leave Milfy, and Billy made her an offer. If Jane needed help, Billy would be there. Jane contacted Billy and asked him if the offer was still good. Billy said it was. Jane asked Billy to sleep with her to give Milfy grounds for divorce. I mean, it's a strategy. Yeah. Uh, Billy agreed. Okay. Well, yeah. Anything to help a friend. <laughs> Good guy, Billy. Good guy. Jane and Billy moved in together right away. Jane got her wish. The divorce from Milfy was finalized that May. Billy told Jane that he would protect her from now on. So who was Billy Stafford? Um, well, I think we're about to find out. That's right. On Thursday, February 13th, 1941, in Liverpool, Nova Scotia, Lamont Stafford, owner of a successful junkyard and scrap metal business, and his wife, Winnie, welcomed their second child, Lamont William Billy Stafford. 
Before they were done building their family, the Staffords had three more natural children and adopted a sixth. Holy gee. It's a big family, but yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of larger families in rural Nova Scotia. And, and we're talking 1941. Yeah, exactly. Uh, although their relationship, uh, you know, was strained because Billy started to rebel right away, he would sometimes even help his father at the junkyard. And thanks to his size, Billy took many opportunities to torture his schoolmates and gained a reputation as a bully. So, I mean, he's lifting metal at the junkyard and he's getting yeah. quite quite strong and that kind of thing. His trajectory does not sound peaceful and positive. It isn't. Eventually, Billy's hate for being told what to do boiled over and he even came to blows with his father. You know, when grown... Billy was an imposing figure at 250 pounds over six feet. He loved to throw his weight around. Intimidation was Billy Stafford's jam. Hmm. Billy even lied and told people he was born on Friday the 13th, all part of the tough guy persona he wanted to show everyone in town. He wanted to be seen as the toughest guy around, and he was pretty successful at it. Billy's neighbors were terrified of him, and most steered far clear. He drove like a crazy person, Ignoring posted speed limits and other rules of the road, he was often drunk behind the wheel. Billy did what he wanted. Billy Stafford was known to police. No, you don't say. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. He clearly resented the cops and gave them a hard time whenever they came around for a variety of reasons. The RCMP came in pairs and armed. Billy liked to drink, and when he was pissed, he was not exactly a gentleman. The fact that he had loaded firearms around was another thing the cops were very cautious of. He'd blow them off with a wave of his hand and even tore up a court summons at one point. And Billy really loved his guns. He was well known around Queens County as a deer jacker. Now, did you know before I read this to you what a deer jacker was? No, my, what, I, what I thought it was is greatly different than how you describe it. So Scott, do you want to do you want to explain what you thought a deer jacker was? Well, maybe somebody who needs to collect semen samples from deer. <laughs> I mean, that's logical, right? Oh my god. Well, people need to work, my <laughs> For those of you not from Nova Scotia, Scott, <laughs> deer jacking was the practice of shining a very bright light at a deer at night. Often out of season, the deer would freeze in place and stare at the light, giving the hunter time to take aim and kill the am animal with whatever firearm they had with them. Yep. Pretty different than what I thought it was. It is <laughs> very different. Uh, I know people who have been charged and convicted of shining a light of more than 4.5 volts at night on wildlife habitat not owned by that person. Hmm. And the fine is a whopping $2,422.50. That's a substantial fine. It really is. Yeah. So don't point a light at a deer at night in Nova Scotia or you will be paying money. Huh. Two but what, what, like, what about a car? People use cars for that too. But I'm saying, like, wouldn't that, like, if you hit a deer with a car... Wouldn't that qualify? Let's not talk. Yeah. Let's right. not get I'm that just, deep into this. I'm just trying to be a defense lawyer over here. <sighs> Billy married his first wife, Pauline, when he was 21 years old. He was pleasant and charming at first, but that didn't last. He began beating Pauline soon after they moved in together. In the six years that they were married, Pauline was pregnant much of the time. They had five kids over that. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that didn't stop Billy. Billy beat Pauline when she was pregnant, too. At least once, Pauline thought she would lose one of their babies after a particularly brutal beating. She didn't. Hey, Billy, you're a piece of shit. Yeah. Pauline went to the cops, pressed charges, but Billy promised to stop hitting her, and she dropped the charges. He didn't stop the beatings for long, and they were worse than before. Because Pauline had betrayed Billy by involving yeah. the cops. So she learned to stay quiet. Mm. Billy choked, punched, and kicked Pauline. He would be all smiles one minute and raging maniac frothing at the mouth the next. He even bit her, drawing blood. Jeez. Billy attempted to drown Pauline by holding her head in a bucket of water, and he used anything he found lying around to hit her with, even a beer bottle. Billy and Pauline's kids didn't fare any better. Billy beat the kids, too, right in their cribs, oh. just for crying or making too much noise. 
Jeez, I, I'm really not liking this fella. Yeah, well, this is his first wife. Yeah. Jane was his third. We got some story to go. Yep. Yes. He took every opportunity he could to terrorize, belittle, and beat his children without mercy. One morning in 1968, after watching Billy beat one of their daughters until she messed her pants in the bas- backyard, Pauline decided to leave. Oh, man, I'm wanting to hurt this man. Billy was uh, going out to sea for two weeks, and Pauline packed up the kids and ran off to Ontario to oh, be with her family. Good on her. Yep. But oh, no. once Billy got back in from sea, he beat the crap out of Pauline's mother, trying to fa- find out where Pauline had gone. You've got to be kidding me. No. This is the, this is this guy. <laughs> My lord. Yep. In a moment of weakness, Pauline reached out to Billy, who begged her to come back to him. Pauline thought better of the idea and wisely decided to stay in Ontario. She has no idea how smart that was. Well, I'm pretty sure she has an idea now. <laughs> well, fine, she's, she's probably read the books. I stand corrected. Yep. Billy became involved with another woman, Faith who moved in with him in 1971. They didn't marry. They were just common law. Mm. As was his pattern, he was nice at first, but he began beating the shit out of Faith, too. He beat her when he was drunk or sober, but mostly he was drunk. In 1972, Faith became pregnant, and after one particularly harsh beating, she ran away to Calgary. So, again, beating up a pregnant lady. Great great guy. Uh. You know... So she was fearing for the for her safety and the the safety of her son Robert. Uh, she didn't return to Liverpool for another seven years. Mm. Billy only ever saw his son once. Faith didn't want Robert to suffer the beatings that she and his other kids had. People were afraid of Billy, and he got off on it. Although there was no proof other than speculation and a history of hate between the two. Billy Stafford was suspected in the disappearance of a fellow crew member who went missing from the fishing vessel he and Billy were on one night at sea. Well, now. It was presumed that Billy threw the much smaller man overboard. The missing man did not know how to swim and has never been found, so his disappearance remained a mystery. Wow. Wow. Yep. Billy. Billy, Billy. Yep. Alan and Jamie were still living with Milfie during Jane and Billy's early relationship. Uh, They had time to themselves, and Jane said that Billy was kind and considerate at first, and she felt safe with him. Again, this is is the guy's pattern. Well, it's classic uh, abusive uh, male pattern. Yep. Jane missed her boys. Billy enjoyed having Jane all to himself and thought Milfie deserved having to deal with them on his own after hurting Jane the way he had. Still, Jane wanted her kids to be with her, as any mother would. Mm. Billy Stafford wanted kids of his own with Jane. He was upset when he found out she was on the pill and tossed them down the drain. Didn't take long, and Jane was pregnant again in the summer of 1976. Billy's mood started to darken. Jesus, so worse than it is now? Well, I mean, he was nice to her at first. Right? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. I thought you meant overall he began to darken. Well, maybe. Because I'm like thinking throwing a man overboard on a boat's pretty dark. <laughs> yep. But there's no proof of that. Nope. Jane had even taken Billy's last name, even though they weren't married. He started getting angrier, and he was colder than before, less attentive. She was pregnant. Mm. They were, rarely went out anymore. Billy said he was embarrassed. And upset with Jane because she was having problems controlling her bladder due to the pregnancy. And he was very cruel to her about it. Oh. He said he wouldn't take her anywhere until after she had the baby because she would pee wherever she sat down. He used a a different word for it, but whatever. On May 30th of 1977, Jane had another boy. Billy was not there. He was at sea. Jane named their son Darren Edward Stafford. Jane's doctor recommended a tubal ligation. It had been a particularly difficult birth. Mm. But in the 70s, a husband had to sign off on an operation that would make a woman infertile. Wow. Right? I can just, uh, that unto itself it angers me. At different times. Yeah, well. Billy was not pleased when he returned from sea, and Jane asked him to sign the form for her surgery. Oh, boy. From Life with Billy by Brian Valley, Billy says... Fuck that. 
You expect me to sign for an operation that makes you no fucking good anymore? No way, old woman. No way. Charming fellow. Charming fellow. But it was already done. The surgery had happened the previous day. <sighs> Signing the papers were just a formality. I, I'm, like, anxious. Like, I'm pretend, like picturing myself in her situation. I'm like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Well, Billy was livid. Oh. And resented Jane going ahead with the tubal without his consent. Taking control from Billy was the biggest sin Jane could have committed. Life with Billy was going to be a lot tougher from, from, from then on. Billy would see to that. Jane told Billy that the doctor had told her to rest a few weeks after her surgery, but Billy wanted none of it. He was pissed off. Billy told Jane he expected her to start keeping house right away. She had wanted the operation... Now Billy wanted her to pay for it. Oh, my God. Jane's life had become a nightmare again, but it got worse. Billy did not clean up after himself at all. The house they lived in had no running water nor laundry facilities. Everything had to be done by hand, and she had just had a baby and an operation. I was gonna, like I was going to say, can you imagine, like, just on a regular circumstances, living in a house with... Uh, with no running water? Yeah, and, and then imagine now trying to raise a newborn baby. And you've just had surgery. Uh, you've got stitches in and a husband who won't help. Uh, Billy was belittling Jane, telling her she looked awful and was extremely rough with her sexually, taking her whenever he wanted, even right after she had the stitches removed uh, after her operation. Billy and Jane moved from Charleston to nearby Bangs Falls in August of 1977, so they upgraded houses mm -hmm. a little bit. It's not the best area, but... I'm sure it's better than, <laughs> better than where it sounds they like they were. Jane began working at an old folks' home near the place uh, to earn some extra cash. Billy resented any attempt by Jane to exercise any form of independence... He stole money that Jane earned from her purse, and then when confronted about it, would scream in Jane's face, denying he'd taken the money. Oh. Billy had not hit Jane yet, but in November of 1977, all that changed. Jane had been out all day, having baby pictures taken of Darren. Billy and a pal were home drinking. Jane brought home Kentucky Fried Chicken, which mm. is now known as KFC. Yeah. yeah. I guess because they can't say the word chicken anymore. It was just everybody had been calling it that, so they just went with. Yeah. Anyway, Billy screamed for, for the chicken and yelled at Jane for being out all day. After his friend left, Billy beat Jane for the first time, accusing her of bringing the chicken home just to impress the other man. Wow. What an insecure man. Yep. The beatings became more regular. Jane was terrified of Billy, especially when he was drinking. So was their young son, Darren. Darren would cower and hide when his father came home from sea. Billy resented Darren's fear of him. He beat Darren, too, at least once with a mop handle. Ugh. Billy fired his rifle out the window once, the bullet landing very near Jane, who was working in the garden. Billy was trying to get her attention. Billy was inside, punching his son uh, multiple times for crying when he'd split his lip after a fall. Oh, my God. And apparently the kid had made a mess, so Billy wanted to clean it up. He often threatened Darren, even pointing a loaded rifle at his head. Your little kid. My God. Jane's son, Alan, now 16, wanted to come live with her. He wasn't getting along at Milfie's and missed his mum. Jane agreed to have Alan move in, but she was afraid that Billy Stafford would start abusing Alan, too. I, I'm going to imagine that was a correct assumption. Jane was right. Yep. From the moment Alan moved in, even though he tried hard to stay off Billy's radar, he ended up getting punched, slapped, and kicked regularly, sometimes for no reason. One night, Billy thought the younger boy, Darren, was eating too slowly. Billy force-fed him his dinner, and when the boy vomited it, Billy scoo scooped up the mess and forced him to eat it again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something bold here. What? I don't like this man. <laughs> no. He even beat Jane's dog, Blue. God. Life went on like that. The entire family began to look forward to Billy being out at sea. Those days were a respite. As his return loomed, their fear intensified. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, 
they would never leave because they always thought that he was going to come find them. I can understand that fear. Yep. Yeah. It didn't matter if Billy Stafford was drunk or sober. He beat and tortured his family whenever the mood struck. Jane had tried to stand up to him once in a while, but that all changed one day. As Jane was bent over putting wood in the wood stove, a shot rang out, slammed into the wall just over Jane's head. And this is in the kitchen inside the house. Billy was lying on his bed. He had fired his twenty two in Jane's direction through the open bedroom door into the kitchen, just narrowly missing her. Jane was terrified, like if she had stood up, he would have killed her. Yeah. yeah. Billy yelled, though, that if he'd wanted to hit her, he would have, and she would be dead. Jane began to fear for her life. When she threatened to leave Billy, he told her that if she did, he knew she'd be back, and if she wasn't, if she didn't come back... Billy would shoot the rest of Jane's family. Just a terrible man. Terrible. It doesn't get much worse. <laughs> well. Well, you know what I mean. Like, it, it's, it's a horrible situation, that's for sure. It, yeah. Billy said he was immortal and that his power came from the devil. Well, it's hard to disagree with him. There's some cray-cray in there. <laughs> Jane was not allowed to go to church or even reference it. Well... Billy was well known as a bully around Queens County. I am so surprised. I thought he would be, you know, volunteering at the children's hospital or something. Right? Right. Helping old ladies across the street. Yeah, with their groceries. Yeah. Yeah. Or helping himself to their groceries. <laughs> oh, well. Cats, so, trees, rescues. Well, he had lots of violent run ins with neighbors and Jane's co workers at the old folks' home. Billy even punched Jane's father, Morris, after he'd said the wrong thing to Billy when they were drinking together. The RCMP was very familiar with Billy Stafford. Billy met his match in Constable Gary Grant. Billy hated Grant. I personally knew Gary Grant. And I'm going to say I like Gary Grant. Oh, yeah. Because Billy hates him. Yeah. Uh, Bear, uh, Gary was a big guy, yeah. uh, 6'3", and he looked like wow. the typical rural RCMP officer, right down to his giant mustache. Oh, sweet, yes. Yeah. Yeah, cropped hair, big mustache, just big dude. Would fit in perfectly in Super Troopers by the sound of it. Oh, yeah. Constable Grant was not someone to trifle with, but neither was Billy. Grant and Billy clashed a few times, and Billy wanted to kill him. One night after a run-in with Grant, he told Jane about it. And he admitted to something else. Mm -hmm. From Brian Valley's book, Life with Billy... One of these days, I'll get that fucking Grant, shrieked Billy. I'll get him alone somewhere, and I guarantee you the only one of us will be coming out alive. I killed one man already and got away with it. It would be a real thrill to kill that cocksucker. And what do you mean? You killed one man already, asked Jane, frightened but curious. Do you remember Jimmy LeBlanc? He supposedly jumped overboard a few years back. Well, he never jumped. I threw him overboard. He made me mad, and I threw him over the side, and I'm going to kill Grant when I get him alone. No witnesses, just the same as with Jimmy. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, believe him. That he's a murderer? Yeah, I mean, it, it fits his personality. Yeah, he sounds like a like a typical sociopath, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, at least, at the very least, a narcissist. Absolutely. Yeah. Billy also did horrible things to Jane sexually every time he came in from the boats. If you want more detail, it's easy to find, but we don't feel that elaborating serves any good purpose. Just know he was not above anything, including penetrating Jane with random household objects whenever he liked, and forcing his wife into acts of bestiality with the family dog. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Jane believed the police wouldn't help but she was too afraid of Billy to even start the process. She thought that unless a woman was visibly badly injured, they wouldn't help. She was told to get a lawyer and press charges herself. She contemplated suicide. Yeah. She even put a load of gun to Billy's head when he was sleeping one night. She said she didn't pull the trigger because she didn't want the children to wake up to a mess. Hmm. Jane even tried to hire a hitman. She knew a guy from Riverport, a fishing acquaintance of Billy's, who had a gun. Jane offered him $20,000 to do away with Billy Stafford. Hmm. The man considered it, but figured he'd get caught, or that Billy would either get away somehow and come after him. Yeah, I can. That seems like a rational fear. <laughs> right? 
Jane was at the end of her rope. She started considering other options. On the morning of March 11, 1982, it started like many others. Billy climbed on top of Jane and humped until he was done and then rolled off. Mm -hmm. By now, Jane cringed every time Billy touched her, but he didn't seem to care. Billy had a brief yelling match with the next door neighbor, Margaret Jodry, who he hated. Billy told the older, older lady that he was going to burn her trailer down with her in it. Jane knew it was going to be a bad day. You don't say. Billy wanted money to go into town to pick up some booze. Jane claimed she only had enough to pay the auto insurance at the end of the month. Billy didn't give a shit. He marched over to Jane's purse and rifled through it, taking what he wanted. Billy and his pal, Ronnie Wombolt, and these are very Lunenburg County names, mm. by the way, Lunenburg Queens County names. Mm. Uh, Ronnie had been crashing at the house for a while, uh, and he drove with, with Billy to Milton to get a 26-ounce bottle of rum, or we would call it a quart. Why not? Get it. Names from that. Why not in Wombold? Yeah, exactly. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you a Wombold story one day. Oh, I'm excited. Billy and Ronnie came back around supper time. The bottle was half done and they were stoned on weed. They also had a five gallon can of gas that Billy claimed he was going to use to burn Margaret's trailer down. Oh. After dinner, Billy told Jane that she had to drive he and Ronnie over to a friend's place. He knew they'd be playing cards and there'd be more beer. The two men forced Jane to pull the truck over so they could smoke another joint on the way. At the friend's house, they played cards and drank more. Jane sat by and watched. On the way home, at around 8.30, Billy ranted and laughed about how he was going to burn Margaret's trailer down and that she wouldn't get out alive. Billy said he was going to take care of Jane's son, Alan, at mm. the same time. He wanted to kill two birds with one stone. Wow. Jane was horrified but said nothing. Billy had directly threatened the life of her eldest son. She knew he was not afraid to follow through on a threat. He had killed before, after all. Jane kept driving. Billy closed his eyes and passed out. Jane pulled into the driveway of their home, 227, Bangs Falls. Ronnie Womble got out of the truck, staggered into the house, and went to bed. Alan, Jane's son, had just gone to bed. He heard the truck pull in and Ronnie stumble in and pass out. Jane sat in the truck, afraid to leave Billy alone. He had told her before that she had to wait for him to wake up before leaving or she'd get a beating. Mm. Jane made her decision. She honked the horn once. Billy didn't wake up. Alan heard the horn but thought that Jane and Billy were fighting in the truck again and then one of them hit the horn yeah, accidentally. Yeah. Jane honked the horn again, longer this time. Alan got out of bed, went to the door. He saw his mother in the driver's seat only three meters away. Billy was passed out beside her. The driver's side window was rolled down. Jane calmly told Alan to get a gun and load it. This wasn't unusual. Billy would sometimes ask for a gun after seeing a buck in the field close by on the way up the driveway. Alan loaded a 12-gauge shotgun. Alan went outside without the shotgun to make sure that's what they wanted. Jane, now standing outside the truck, again told him to bring the gun. Alan brought the shotgun to Jane. She then told Alan to go back inside. Jane walked up to the door of the truck put the shotgun to Billy's head, turned her head away and pulled the trigger. Good. Blammo. Alan came out after hearing the shot. Jane handed him the gun and told him to take it to Margaret Jodry's trailer, but first bring her a garbage bag filled with a change of clothes. Jane was covered in blood and Billy's brains. Huh. Jane said that Margaret and her boyfriend Roger would help get rid of the gun. Jane drove Billy seven miles to where it'd be found the next day. Alan called his grandmother in Danesville nearby, the Teleglobe facility. It was this big white sort of globe thing. Mm. And we used to call it the satellite station. Alan told his grandmother to come and pick Jane up on the road near there. Mm. Alan and Margaret Jodry's boyfriend, Roger, broke the gun into three pieces and threw it into the Medway River nearby. They then went to clean up the blood back at Jane and Billy's place. There was blood spatter everywhere because the blood yeah. had spattered out of the truck. Yeah, a shotgun, close proximity to the head. Yep. Yeah. Jane's parents found her walking along the road. 
in the rain carrying a garbage bag. She had changed out of the bloody clothes and put them in the bag and left the truck and Billy behind her. Jane's parents wanted to know what was wrong, but she wouldn't tell them. She just wanted to go home. It wasn't unusual for her to call them in the middle of the night for something like this. Mm-hmm. They drove Jane home, and as they reached the turnoff to Jane and Billy's, Jane said that she wanted to get out and walk the rest of the way. Jane's folks, although worried, let Jane out and drove off. Jane went to the house she had shared with Billy, and Alan, Margaret, and Roger soon arrived. Again from Valley's book, Life with Billy, Jane said, It's all over. I won't have to put up with it anymore. I blew his fucking brains out. Probably a, a huge sense of relief. Yeah, but there's more common, right? Like, yeah, but there that you've been that, living every second of your life in fear, mm-hmm. and suddenly you don't have to. That that thing that you fear is gone. Yes. So there's got to be. But I I would say it would be replaced with new fears. Ah, uh, probably not as terrifying as him. Yeah. In my opinion. Fair enough. Billy's headless corpse was found in his truck on the road near the satellite station the next morning. The inside of the truck was covered with what was left of Billy's head. Yes, yeah, probably the best use it'd been put to his whole life. The RCMP came right to the Stafford residence in Bangs Falls and took Jane to the Liverpool detachment for questioning. They photographed the bruises all over Jane's body. They tried to get her to talk. But she wouldn't. She seemed emotionally cold. She was taking Valium since that morning. Mm -hmm. Cops said that they knew Billy was abusive, and they also knew she had tried to hire a hitman. She still didn't talk. Interesting that they knew that. Yeah. He asked to see Billy's father, Lamont. Lamont came in, and when he asked her if she had killed Billy, she finally admitted she had. She was the one who shot him. Mm -hmm. All the years of abuse came pouring out, Jane told her story. She admitted to the whole thing and walked cops through exactly what had happened that night. Not feeling Jane was a danger to anyone else or a flight risk, Jane was allowed to go home. Wow. Mm -hmm. They didn't arrest her. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that uh, uh, that's wrong. I mean, I think league, like... uh, it should be, but I mean, like, I, I can, you know, I'm empathizing with her. I'm like, good, go home. Eventually, she, she was arrested. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so she hired a lawyer named Alan Farrier, and Farrier is this weasley little guy about 5'2", <laughs> and uh, he'd later become a well-known criminal lawyer in my hometown, and I was personally cross-examined by him. <laughs> When I was testifying against a former friend, quote, who thought it was a good idea to use my head like a handball against a brick wall. My friend had been charged with assault causing bodily harm, and Alan Ferrier lost that case. But tell me more about what happened to this friendship, Mike. (laughs) (laughs) I would imagine it immediately ended. It did. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Jane Hirschman's case was a little different. Uh, At some point, Jane changed her story. She signed a statement saying her son, Alan, had shot Billy to save her life while while he was beating her up in the truck. Hmm. Jane and Alan were charged with first-degree murder on March 25th, 1982, and they were both locked up pending trial. Hmm. Jane took a polygraph, though. She failed when she claimed Alan had pulled the trigger. They asked Jane again who pulled the trigger, and she admitted she had. Alan was released. At trial, the prosecution did their best to prove that Jane had been planning to murder Billy for some time, and they did a good job of that. Bringing up the incident with the hitman and Jane attempting at one point to acquire poison to do Billy in. Hmm. Farrier tore into Crown Witnesses with intelligent cross-examination, and when it came time for the defense to present its case, he did a masterful job calling psychiatrists and victims of Billy's abuse, ending with his two previous wives. He argued that Jane had killed Billy Stafford in self-defense. Yeah. The jury agreed. Yeah. Jane Hirschman was found not guilty. Wow. Jane and her sons, Alan and Darren, went to Ontario for a while to escape. However, 
Alan Ferrier had warned her that this would happen, and it did. The Crown appealed the jury's verdict, as the judge's description of self-defense was, quote, too broad. Hmm. The RCMP officer who delivered the summons to Jane in Ontario even apologized for having to do his job <laughs> and serving her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some police officers thought Jane should be getting a reward for ridding the planet of the likes of Billy Stafford. Right. But no. She had more courtroom time to face. No. Not wanting to go through another trial, Jane pled guilty to manslaughter. She was sentenced to six months in prison and two years of probation. Mm. The judge sentencing her made a point of saying Jane had been judge, jury, and executioner, and that the sentence was to act as a deterrent for battered wives wanting to take the law into their own hands in the future. He felt she should have reached out for help. Yeah, I, I, I get from his standpoint, but... Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, Jane spent two months in jail and then got out, and she went to vocational school in Bridgewater to pursue a nursing assistance course. Oh, good. Jane got, a, got counseling, remarried, and started her life all over again. She became an advocate for battered women. Good. Her story doesn't end there, though. Yeah. This is not happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Jane struggled with depression for years after Billy's death. She took an overdose of pills in an attempt to do herself in, and she had been shoplifting. Jane was having a really hard time. On February 22, 1992, a couple noticed a woman slumped in the front seat of a car on the Halifax waterfront. She was non-responsive. Mm -hmm. Police found the woman was dead. She had a thirty-eight caliber handgun in her hand, and she'd been shot once in the chest. It was Jane Hirschman. Oh, that's really sad. Even though... Some felt she'd been murdered. Jane's death was ruled a suicide. Was it Jane's guilt at having killed Billy that finally did her in? The mind of a survivor is a mixed up place sometimes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I can, I can vouch for that. Yeah. Much of the research for this episode came from Brian Valley's detailed book, Life with Billy, commemorative edition. Valley spent a lot of time with Jane Hirschman and her first hand accounts of her life with Billy Stafford are both graphic and chilling. There are a few incidents that we felt were even too much for this podcast. If you're truly curious, you can read Valley's excellent book. We'll link to it in on Amazon so you can read for yourself if you're so inclined. And if you've got Kindle Unlimited in Canada, at least, the book is free to read right now and approves a lot more, uh, provides a lot more detail than I could give you here in this podcast. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that one, Scott? Yeah, uh, lots of thoughts. Um, I don't like Billy. No. Nope. Well, uh, you don't have to. Yeah, and, and I don't. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it, like it's, I, I'm not advocating uh, vigilante justice or uh, killing somebody, but I'm not going to lie. I, I, hearing the story, hearing it from her perspective, I suppose, um, I felt some re relief when he was when she killed him. Yeah, you know, uh, I can very much empathize. As I was saying earlier, when every second of your day is occupied with absolute fear and punishment, uh, it's a prison camp, you know, and and that's a slow burn. And I can understand why. It built to where it built. Uh, I'm curious, though, when she first um, admitted the crime, admitted what she did, yep. and then the second, uh, and then re kind of recanted it and said uh, her son Alan shot him. Well, Alan I, was saying that, too. I, uh, Yeah, I'm imagining that was, a, it found it odd, but I'm imagining it was a strategy when she went back home. And I, I wonder if it was like Alan who actually was like, Mom, say it was me. I'm a, a juvenile, maybe. Like, I won't yep, get, you know. That is apparently what the story uh, was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that he would get a lighter sentence or whatever. I mean, she ended up only doing two months in jail after yeah, all. Yeah, but you're going to be thinking, like, this could easily be a, you've killed somebody. You've life in jail. So, yeah. you know, I can see why that yeah. strategy, but she couldn't even keep that. Like, you know, kind of goes to show her character. She's like... She quickly was like, no, I, yeah, it was me. Yeah. 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 She, she just sounded like a very damaged individual. I have just... And hearing that she killed herself at the end, it's just... Uh, a poor, like, just a human brought onto this planet. And 
her life was structured in a way that that was going to be the end result and it's just it's just it's so sad it's such a sad sad story uh even though she shot somebody in my opinion she's the victim yeah she's the victim and uh yeah i don't uh yeah it's a really it's a really hard one to hear it's really uh difficult it's uh just tragic all around yep. and i mean you know hearing about her father's alcoholism and it's it's just so sad how kids do uh absorb their environment yeah and uh, in many regards are uh, doomed to repeat yep and so it's just yeah just set set up to fail from the beginning it's just sad absolutely so that's it for this episode, and we want to say thank you to a few new patron Patreon patrons. Uh, thank you to April from Calgary, Alberta. Thanks, April. Lauren, another Aussie from Dubbo. I just love that name, Dubbo. Yeah. And also Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The Dubbo. Uh, cousin Andrea from Ontario upped her pledge so she could hear our uh, our extra episodes once we start putting them out. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that my voice is starting to come back. Less crackly. It's probably going to be sooner rather than later. I've got a, I've got one, at least one written, mm -hmm. and I'm about to write another. So, Sweet. yeah, we're going to bang those out pretty quick. Uh, Steph from Barrie, Ontario. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. And Jillian from North Vancouver. Hoo hoo, locals. Yay, Jillian. I do like the name Jillian as well. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't Jillian Anderson. Oh, okay. Then I don't like it anymore. No, I'm kidding. I still do. Well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have some Patreon rewards going out soon because some people are coming up on the two months, and that's the that's the thing. You must have been with us for two months before we send you things. So Scott will have to actually have to write longhand a thank you to somebody. Oh, good luck reading it. Yeah, exactly. Or deciphering it. So if you want to do donate to us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine or send us some donate, uh, donut money, some donate money <laughs> well, technically. Uh, via PayPal at our uh, pod, dark poutine podcast at gmail.com. Uh, still waiting on that $50,000. Uh, yeah, a part of that 50000 can go uh, towards me getting a calligraphy lessons so I can be a better handwriter. Sure. Yeah. So we've got a promo this week uh, by Chelsea and David of Based on a True Crime podcast. So here it is. I'm Chelsea, and I love true crime. And I'm David, and I love horror movies. And we co-host Based on a True Crime, a podcast where we discuss the real cases that inspired some of the most gruesome crimes and criminals to grace the big and small screens. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play if you're interested in hearing the true stories behind some really great movies, including In Cold Blood, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, and Murder by Numbers. So grab some popcorn, with extra fake butter topping of course, and join us as we explore just how much of the movies that kept you awake at night are real. Thank you to Chelsea and David of Based on a True Crime for that promo. Uh, we were doing a little bit of promo swapping with different people, and you'll hear us probably, or me at least, on another pro on another podcast. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. If you, uh, yeah, other cool stuff being now, we have swag. You get that damn Yumber Yard hoodie and shirt, that's, people. That's right. Oh, my God. Yes, that's, a great design, now. Mike. Great design. Thank you. It was it was fun to do. I, I've got a hoodie on, on the way. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of shirts for us, too, that are coming. Oh, and we may just give a shirt away here. Oh, I think we should. Oh, well, we are definitely going to, actually. Yeah. I ordered an extra one. Yeah. So if you have any story ideas, questions, comments, or just want to say hi, you can reach us via email at darkproteinpodcast at gmail.com. Lots of people have. Yeah. It's getting so now, like, I have to check every morning and every evening <laughs> and sometimes I forget and then I, I don't respond for a day and I feel like crap. Well, you and, know what? You're a terrible person. I'm kidding. You can leave us an internet voicemail from your PC at darkpoutine.com slash message and we'll play it on a future episode. Actually, somebody did leave us one and here it is. 
Hi, Mike and Scott. This is Laura Urquhart. I can't leave an internet voicemail because I don't have a PC, but I wanted to say how much I really enjoy your podcast. I love listening to the two of you. Thank you so much, and keep the poutine coming. Uh, so thank you for that interesting voicemail. <laughs> yeah, that was it was interesting. Interesting it indeed. Was, it was short and to the point. Succinct. Succinct. Yeah. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, just search for Dark Poutine and tell your friends about us. Especially fun is our closed Facebook group, which I've changed the name of it to the Yumber Yard. Now, I think so. that's perfect. Yeah, we're we're active there, and you can meet some other cool listeners as well. And of course, you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, like iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or at our host Podbean. Lots of you are leaving five star reviews and comments on iTunes, and we appreciate each one. It helps us go up those rankings. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Every little bit helps. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for letting us fill your ears with another helping of dark poutine. And don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.